that can get confusing about supply and demand shifts is dealing with issues caused by the magnitude of the shift or how big it is. And let me show you how that works. And this can be a problem if you're dealing with a multiple choice question and you're drawing yourself a picture in the margin. You go, oh, well, that's what I got when I drew the picture. Because sometimes how you draw the picture can impact the nature of your answer. And you don't want to fall into that trap because that's a conceptual thing that I would expect you to have a couple of questions on on the AP exam. So let's say we're dealing with supply and demand again, just a basic graph. And we haven't touched elasticity yet. That's a whole other ball game. But let's start here with equilibrium price, equilibrium quantity. And let's say you have, um, well, let's go back to the idea of corn. And say that we have an increase in demand for corn because it's being used in ethanol. Using a food product for ethanol was probably not the best thing we could have done, but that's where we are, and we're seeing ships in the corn market. So, we have a big jump in demand. for corn because it's being used in ethanol. Because we have this big jump in demand, we see the price has gone up because this is our new equilibrium. And if producers are looking at that going, oh wait, higher prices, let's switch to corn production. We see a big jump in the supply of corn. So we see supply increase. Now, from those complementary changes, they both shifted to the right. What we end up with is a change in price and a change in quantity. Now, depending on how you've drawn this, you might go, oh wait, the price is almost the same, the quantity is bigger, and you look at the answers to the question and you think, oh, well, price is the same, quantity has increased. That is not necessarily true. That depends on how you've drawn it. Because if the way you drew it was that you had a small increase in supply, for example, price went up. If you show it with a really huge increase in supply, let's go way out here. Oh, look, price went down. This is an ambiguity. What we call that is an indeterminate change due to the magnitude of the shift. supply and demand shifts, you've got to be careful. If you increase supply and demand, quantity definitely will increase, but you don't know about price. So you've got to be careful. You've got to think about what happens if I draw it a little bit differently. And if you don't get the same answer, then you can't use it as an absolute. Another complication in dealing with supply and demand curves is knowing what's going to happen with different categories of products. The key to determining if something is a normal good or an inferior good, and some books include neutral, but a lot of them leave it out. I'm going to give it to you because conceptually it will fill a gap in a lot of textbooks. Um, the key to these is knowing what happens to demand when you have a change in income. So this is really the key. change or what shift do we see in demand with the change in income? If income increases, and 
that's the one that I'm going to use for each of these. And just know that the opposite is going to be true if income decreases. Okay. If income increases, for a normal good, you're going to buy more, which means demand will shift right. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to buy twice as many groceries at the grocery store if your income doubles. It means that you'll spend more money on food. Maybe you'll go to more expensive restaurants, for example. That would increase your spending on that category for you. That would be a normal good. For an inferior good, these would be products that have some kind of a stigma associated with a lower income. With an inferior good, if your income increases, demand will shift left. So you see opposites here. With a normal good, you have a direct relationship between income and demand. That means as income increases, demand increases, they move in the same direction. Direct, same direction. With inferior goods, these are opposites. And now I can't think of word. Inverse. Thank you. They have an inverse relationship. Which means demand will decrease for an increase in income. Income goes up, demand goes down. Backwards. Um, normally we would think of things that, you know, people would not buy if they had more money. Maybe spam, uh, maybe generic brand foods, you know, really cheap restaurants, for example, where you would just cut back or stop buying them all together. For a neutral good, and there aren't too many products that may actually fall into this category, which is why some books don't deal with this one at all. Neutral implies that there's no change. And that's what happens with these. So let's say, for example, you have more money. You may not spend any more money on toothpaste. Most people have brand loyalty to their toothpaste. They're like, you know what? I'm buying Crest no matter how much money I have, or I'm buying Colgate no matter how much money I have. So that you have no change in demand. No change in demand. And again, there aren't very many that maybe fall into this category. How you categorize a good depends on individual consumer behavior, which makes it a little bit strange that this is in macro and not microeconomics. You may see some cross-pollination with that. But remember, normal goods, direct relationship between income and demand, inferior goods, inverse relationship, and neutral, no change.